The unusual shape of the necked carotid funnel has led to its interpretation as an irreversible proboscis, but this is difficult to reconcile with the fossil evidence. Instead, its fluid dynamics seem optimal for a role in jet propulsion, where it would have maintained an efficient slow flow of water over the large internal gills. The affinity of nectocaries has been a controversial subject, and some scientists feel that it is still uncertain. The balance of evidence seems to suggest a relationship with the cephalopods, whether in an ancestral or derived position. Ammonites are excellent index fossils and it is often possible to link the rock layer in which a particular species or genus is found to specific geologic time periods. Their fossil shells usually take the form of planus spirals, although there were some helically spiraled and non-spiraled forms. The name ammonite, from which the scientific term is derived, was inspired by the spiral shape of their fossilized shells, which somewhat resemble tightly coiled ram's horns. Ammonoid septa characteristically have bulges and indentations and are to varying degrees convex from the front, distinguishing them from nautiloid septa which are typically simple concave dish-shaped structures. The topology of the septa, especially around the rim, results in the various suture patterns found. Because ammonites and their close relatives are extinct, little is known about their way of life. Their soft body parts are very rarely preserved in any detail. Nonetheless, much has been worked out by examining ammonoid shells and by using modules of these shells in water tanks. Many ammonoids probably lived in the open water of ancient seas, rather than at the sea bottom because their fossils are often found in rocks laid down under conditions where no bottom-dwelling life is found. Many of them are thought to have been good swimmers, with flat, discus-shaped, streamlined shells, although some ammonoids were less effective swimmers and were likely to have been slow-swimming bottom-dwellers. Synchrotron analysis of an aptico for an ammonite revealed remains of isopod and mollusk larvae in its buccal cavity, indicating at least this kind of ammonite fed on plankton. They may have avoided predation by squirting ink, much like modern cephalopods, ink is occasionally preserved in fossil specimens. The soft body of the creature occupied the largest segments of the shell at the end of the coil. The smaller earlier segments were walled off and the animal could maintain its buoyancy by filling them with gas. Thus, the smaller sections of the coil would have floated above the larger sections. Many ammonite shells have been found with round holes once interpreted as a result of limpets attaching themselves to the shells. However, the triangular formation of the holes, their size and shape, and their presence on both sides of the shells, corresponding to the upper and lower jaws, is more likely evidence of the bite of a medium-sized mosasaur preying upon ammonites. The majority of ammonite species feature planus spiral, flat coiled shells, but other species feature nearly straight shells. Still other species shells are coiled helically, similar in appearance to some gastropods. Some species shells are even initially uncoiled, then partially coiled, and finally straight at maturity. 
these partially uncoiled and totally uncoiled forms began to diversify mainly during the early part of the Cretaceous and are known as heteromorphs. Perhaps the most extreme and bizarre looking example of a heteromorph is Nibonites, which appears to be a tangle of irregular whirls lacking any obvious symmetric coiling. Upon closer inspection, though, the shell proves to be a three-dimensional network of connected U-shapes. Nipponites occurs in rocks of the upper part of the Cretaceous in Japan and the United States. Ammonites vary greatly in the ornamentation of their shells. Some may be smooth and relatively featureless, except for growth lines, and resemble that of the modern Nautilus. In others, various patterns of spiral ridges and ribs or even spines are shown. This type of ornamentation of the shell is especially evident in the later ammonites of the Cretaceous. do occur in exceptional logger statin such as the Solnhofen limestone, their soft part record is surprisingly bleak. Beyond a tentative ink sac and possible digestive organs, no soft parts are known at all. They likely bore a radula and beak, a marginal siphuncle, and ten arms. They operated by direct development with sexual reproduction, were carnivorous, and had a crop for food storage. They are unlikely to have dwelt in fresh or brackish water. Many ammonites were likely filter feeders, so adaptations associated with this lifestyle like sieves probably occurred. The extinction of the ammonites, along with other marine animals and non-avian dinosaurs, has been attributed to the Cretaceous, Paleogene extinction event, marking the end of the Cretaceous period. Eight or so species from only two families made it almost to the end of the Cretaceous, the order having gone through a more or less steady decline since the middle of the period. Six other families made it well into the upper Maastrichtian, but were extinct well before the end. All told, 11 families entered the Maastrichtian, a decline from the 19 families known from the Cenomanian in the middle of the Cretaceous. One reason given for their demise is the Cretaceous ammonites, being closely related to coleoids, had a similar reproductive strategy in which huge numbers of eggs were laid in a single batch at the end of the lifespan. These, along with juvenile ammonites, are thought to have been part of the plankton at the surface of the ocean, where they were killed off by the effects of an impact. Nautiloids, exemplified by modern nautices, are conversely thought to have had a reproductive strategy in which eggs were laid in smaller batches many times during the lifespan, and on the seafloor well away from any direct effects of such a bolide strike, and thus survived. Many ammonite species were filter feeders, so they might have been particularly susceptible to marine faunal turnovers and climatic change. 